Hi everyone, on behalf of Alumni and Family Relations, welcome. I'm Karen Sullivan, a Fall 90 alum and Associate Director of Alumni and Family Relations. Um, during this year of, a, of virtual events, it's been my pleasure to introduce our change makers to the Hampshire community and beyond, and my pleasure to welcome so many to these events. In many cases, these are folks who wouldn't have made it to campus otherwise. Um, alums have connected with students, faculty have connected with alums they haven't seen in years, and prospective students have gotten a tiny glimpse into what our community is like. Um, I'll be sure to put a link to past recordings in the chat as soon as I'm done talking. In all these events, my role has been convener, learner, and a little bit of tech support. So donning my tech support hat, um, social stuff for today, saying hello to Jen or Fariba goes in the chat. If you have questions, please put those in the Q&A. Those are easier for us to moderate near the end. Um, if you'd like closed captions, there's a button down at the bottom of your screen that you can use to do that. This event is being recorded, but only the panelists will be be visible, so not be. That said, at the end, we've been promoting everyone from the Hampshire community who's interested to panelists so that you are visible to Jen and to Fariba and to all of us and to each other. So if you want to stay on and connect, just stay on and we will take care of it from our side. That is when we will bid farewell to folks who are not members of the Hampshire community. And we'll keep it short probably today because it's the middle of a busy work and school day. Um, and it's late for one of our hosts. So we wanna let her get on with her evening. Um, if you need tech support during the event, you can reach out directly to me or to Rayanne Wentworth via the chat and we can help you out. Um, and with that, I will now introduce Jennifer Posner and Fariba Nawa. Um, Jen is a Fall 92 alum. She founded the Women in Media and News in 2001, a national media analysis, education, and adv advocacy group. She wrote Reality Bites Back, The Troubling Truth About Guilty Pleasure TV. And she's now working on a forthcoming critical meter critical media literacy graphic novel called Breaking the News. And that is a mouthful. <laughs> and Fariba Dawa is also a Fall 92 alum. She's an independent journalist currently living in Istanbul. Um, she's the author of Opium Nation, Child Brides, Drug Lords, and One Woman's Journey Through Afghanistan. And she's host of the On Spec podcast. Jen and Fariba, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Karen, for that wonderful introduction. Um, Jennifer, it's great to see you, albeit virtually after such a long time. We've kept, we've kept in touch all these years and I'm really impressed with that. Um, I'll, uh, I'll jump right in when, hello to everyone in the Hampshire community. I'm, um, I'm in Istanbul, so it's, it's late in the evening here, but I'm so excited to be doing this because I miss Hampshire. It was one of the best experiences of my life. So you guys are getting that opportunity now. I'm just going to say that, you know, being in Turkey and watching what happened to the U.S. in the last four years has been quite an experience because I covered the Middle East and South Asia. And for a while, I felt like the U.S. had become the Middle East. Um, and <laughs> I'm going to wrap this around quickly to Jennifer. I mean, you guys survived a full year of a pandemic and you've lived through rising white supremacy, you know, hate crimes, even an attempt, almost like a violent coup, which is what we went through here in 2016. Um, and, and just this intense and divisive election um, and all of this disinformation, you know, that just we're living through such an incredible time and you've been a media critic since your first year at Hampshire so let's just run right jump right into this theme of the conversation is can you help us understand the role that news media and pop culture narratives about gender race science elections and more impact our lives and collective realities yeah it's uh First of all, I, I want to say that I'm thrilled to do this with you. Um, I When I talked about this uh, yesterday to help promote it, I was thinking that it's been 29 years since you and I sat in our, fir in our first journalism classes at Hampshire. And Don't remind me. <laughs> no, right. um, but yeah. uh, but the, it's rare, I think, that people 
a maintain a friendship for that long but but more i think that's a testament to hampshire and it's rare in journalism in a media consolidated journalism landscape that's changed so much in the last three decades even just yesterday um dozens and dozens of huffington post reporters were fired overnight and columnists and analysts with no warning some of whom were denied uh, who were waiting for their work visas and now in the middle of the pandemic are going to be uh on the instead of uh, getting paychecks on the phone with lawyers trying to figure out how to stay in the country. Um, our, our industry has changed so much, has consolidated so much that so many people have left journalism. So I think that it's a real testament to the, um, to the ethical uh, approach that Hampshire instilled in us or that we came to Hampshire because we already had, I'm not sure, that we both stayed in journalism and figured out ways to do it independently, even outside of a system that hasn't always supported uh, with the resources we need the work that we've done. Um, so I'm, I'm thrilled to be doing this with you. Um, to answer your question about the, the theme of the event, um, I feel like the best way to start talking about media narratives in relation to uh, the incredibly divisive period of time we've just lived through the last five years or so, but in particularly the last you know year or two, um, is to talk about uh, this one guy, Richard Rose. Uh, I think that was his name it's off the top of my head. But um, months ago, maybe it was sometime in the summer, I feel like it might've been May, I could be getting the dates wrong, but uh, there was a guy who posted a variety of um, of posts on social media that became more and more irate about the pandemic. At first, he posted that his cousin had COVID and his cousin was on, an, uh, on a ventilator and he was so sick and he was worried about his cousin. Um, and then luckily his cousin got better um, over the time, but you'd think that that kind of experience would make somebody take a, a global pandemic seriously. But this guy was very conservative and his and he he likened he liked himself liked to think of himself as kind of an internet troll. He'd post a lot of very provocative and and you know frankly racist, misogynist things online all the time. Um, he listened to a lot of right wing radio, a lot of right wing TV, um, and he would post that stuff too. Um, over time as disinformation spread both from the bully pulpit of the Trump administration as well as from Fox News and right wing radio and Breitbart and uh, social media, a lot of uh, disinformation fake news campaigns around um, the virus is not nothing but the flu, the virus is going to go away, you can cure it with injecting bleach, uh, liberals are just trying to uh, control you, etc. He started posting more and more of those things. Um, eventually, he posted something that said something like, um, I've cut off my uh, cable subscription, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm throwing away my TV, I'm not interested in the media's lies anymore, COVID is stupid, I'm not wearing masks, you can't get me to wear a mask, you can't get me to social distance. And then he'd post on Facebook all these check-ins to bars and restaurants and clubs and such. And then he posted that he was sick. And then he posted that he got COVID. And then he died. Very shortly after talking about how he had, he had, um, decided that the media was lying to him about uh, about COVID. So what he decided were lies were credible journalistic coverage of rising death tolls. What he thought was true was disinformation campaigns, even though he had firsthand experience in his personal life of a family member who had been intubated because of COVID. When I say that media literacy is a life or death issue, I'm, I'm really serious about it. Um, this is a very extreme example, but there are many other examples. Um, you asked about narratives around uh, race and gender in media and how those change. Um, the organization Color of Change has done a lot of research and a report um, about a subject that I've talked about off and on for many years, which is how uh, police shows, cop shows, sort of uh, police porn, basically, anything, you know, the law and orders, the CSIs, et cetera, um, increase uh, misunderstanding and uh, and sort of dehumanization of people of color, in particular of Black people in America, and lead to a culture that makes it seem much more acceptable for police to shoot unarmed 
black people and kill them with no accountability because the narratives in these shows for decades into our living rooms, the narratives are that um, law enforcement always have the best interests at heart, um, that uh, suspects are always suspicious for a reason, um, and that if, uh, you know, if there's a shooting by an officer, uh, the internal affairs are the bad guys, not the officers that shot people. Um, you want to talk about narratives around gender. And um, my book, Reality Bites Back, was about, uh, in a, we'll talk, I can talk a little bit more about that later, but um, in a lot, a lot of ways, my book was about how reality television has functioned for, at the time, a decade, now two decades, as backlash against gender and racial justice, um, in large part because of reinforcing incredibly uh, regressive, outdated tropes about who women are, um, who men are supposed to just be in the world. Um, and so, you know, we, the ultimate impact of, uh, of this, of damaging media narratives, uh, you can see in the course of, of the uh, history of America and the rest of the world in the election of a reality TV producer, not just host, executive producer. Trump was an executive producer of The Apprentice, beamed into American living rooms every day for about, uh, every week for about a decade, um, using a an intentionally false narrative of, uh, to create the idea that a multiply failed, multiply bankrupt billion, uh, um, businessman who ran, who lost billions of dollars for many investors, stiffed his contractors, was multiply accused of sexual assault, et cetera, instead was this master of business, this, um, this authority figure to whom everybody who wants to do well should aspire, who knows what's right for us, who knows how to be prosperous, who is the, uh, the decider, et cetera. That false narrative helped to help to basically create um, a human rights catastrophe. Uh, so yeah, so that's why I believe that media matters. Definitely, and that catastrophe sort of um, torpedoed to the rest of the world, right? We're seeing yeah. that creeping authoritarianism everywhere yeah. and being legitimized um, yeah. and as the ultimate example of what could go wrong. It's reality bites that sort of comes to life in a, <laughs> your book comes to life in a really scary way. Yeah, I mean, I, the, the index of the book, there's like I mean, 10 years before, it, you know, 2010, the index of the book, you know, Trump comma Donald, um, you know, bankruptcies of uh, The Apprentice, uh, women's bodies as success on, um, you know, racist treatment of women of color on, uh, class action lawsuit potential within, et cetera. So, um, but, but this actually makes me think about, um, not just the pop culture side of it, but um, the news side. When I'm mean, we talking about in the beginning, we're talking about Richard Rose and and you know misrepresentations of science in news media, et cetera, um, narratives of cop shows dehumanizing people because we don't have the uh, the regular in, um, voices of average people who are affected by police abuse in those in those stories both in pop culture and in news media, it makes me wonder about your work as a reporter. Um, because obviously nuanced and ethical and challenging journalism is as or more important now than it has ever been, right? Um, but I wanna know from you, from your perspective as somebody who does this work every day on the ground, what does that actually mean, right? Because you and I started talking about this in 1992, I think in Janet Kay's class, or maybe it was 93, right? Yeah. What is yeah. nuanced journalism really about? Um, and it's it, that's a theme that I've uh, sort of worked around in my in my media activism for years. But now it's a nuanced reporting is a buzzword. Finally, 20 years later, 30 years later, it's finally a buzzword. So, can you give us some concrete examples of what nuanced journalism looks like? on the ground, what does it take to produce it? Um, and as a human rights reporter, what's different about the way that you do your work than the norm in a lot of foreign correspondence and in particular, the norm in corporate journalism? Well, first of all, I look white, but I'm not white. So <laughs> that's a, that confuses a lot of people. I am from Afghanistan. 
I'm a child, I'm a refugee who came to America during the Soviet invasion. So my experience of that, that experience in itself really uh, colors the way that I do my reporting. And, and so I came back, you know, I, I reported in Afghanistan for quite some time, uh, right before even the US went there um, under the Taliban. And then I, I was in Iran and Pakistan and, and then finally here in Turkey. And I've witnessed the, the sort of the downfalls of non-nuanced reporting. I mean, one of the things about foreign correspondence is that white men have essentially defined these countries for us, right? Whether it's from the New York Times, and that's luckily that's changing. We're seeing more people from who are not, who are much more educated in about those countries. And that makes a big difference um, reporting on it. For example, I did a story just to give you a concrete example. I'm a foreigner to Turkey. Um, so I am a foreign correspondent here. I'm not a so-called, I'm, you know, native, uh, but I am Muslim. So we have a lot in common. We know, you know, that makes a difference in how we see the culture and the nuances. What does it mean to go to someone's house and take off your shoes? Why do Turks bring in, they don't want you walking barefoot ever. You have to have your, your slippers on when you go in or it's almost offensive to them. I mean, these little things tend to matter in that how they connect with you and how they connect with you is, is, you know, is about access, right? What they're going to tell you. Um, I did one of the, one of the, my favorite stories that I did was a few years ago about the women's movement here, which is one of the strongest feminist movements, I think, that I have witnessed. Um, and it's very intersectional. But the tropes you hear in, in the media, when someone's parachuting into Turkey, they hear, Erdogan wants to be the new sultan. He wants to bring back the Ottoman Empire. Yeah, yeah, he does. But how seriously is that taken? Um, and then there's the secularists and the and and the and Islamists and the religious folks. And then there's a deep divide between them. And I sort of came with that in mind that that you know narrative. Once I started to live here, I started to see that wait, there's a there, there's a lot of gray between those two polarized positions. And when we write about it, we have to understand it. And writing about the women's movement, I got to know the various people in that movement were from Kurdish society, uh, the various ethnicities, the very, I mean, Turkey has been, you know, migration has been a part of Turkey for centuries. And what does it mean? So I went to the women's march, I think it was in 2019. And I was like, These, this is amazing, you know? And I started to understand that in each family, there was an Islamist, there was a secularist, and it wasn't just, the, and, and a lot of them just really got along. But if I didn't know that before. You know, if I had just come in reading the articles that I did from the many people who parachuted in here, that's what I would have gotten. Um, and, it, and then spending time in a country, spending extensive time, and actually, I, I think one of the most important things you can do as a journalist is learn the local language. And that's hard to do. Um, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't parachute in. I think parachuting and anthropology and these kinds of things, traveling is a good thing. But how seriously, how, how good your work will be depends on how deep of a you know, knowledge you'll have. And you can study the language at Hampshire or NYU or whatever, but once you come in, it's a different experience altogether. So I think that's what nuanced reporting is about, is really getting beyond those, those sort of um, black and white issues and into the gray zone. Um, and, and then this sort of, you know, we saw with Rukmini Kalamaki with the New York Times with, uh, and, and, you know, full disclaimer, she's a friend of mine. She came and she apologized for her mistakes, but it, it was a lesson in, in journalism. You go in with a, with a narrative and that's a problem. Don't do that, right? <laughs> You're not gonna come back with something nuanced. And, and then you get burned by sources sometimes. And that's, you, you know, that's just the way it is. And you have to be very, very careful. If, if the locals see you as an outsider, it's very easy to get burned. Um, so, yeah, but I've, actually, um, I know we, we had particularly, for the, what you're saying is making me think of um, the fact that uh, the parachuting in uh, from outsiders is a consistent problem even in the US uh, where uh, sort of New York-based, DC-based, and occasionally California-based, but not usually. It's usually New York-based media and uh, DC-based media will send people into, you know, 
towns where something is is rising up or something is happening um, rather than tapping reporters who are on the ground in those communities long term right so for example in in um the the sort of early days of the black lives matter movement there were people on the ground in those communities who'd been talking about police abuse for years in op-eds, in reporting. Um, and there were activists, local activists in those communities who were responsible for building and nurturing and growing that movement. Um, but what you get a lot of the time are New York Times, AP, et cetera, folks going in, getting a stringer, sending them there um, to sort of talk to whoever they see on the street um, or with, as you say, the preconception of what this movement is, right? So preconceptions around protest is always uh, violent or preconceptions around um, people want special treatment as opposed to basic equity. Um, the, uh, the idea that, uh, the idea that basic human rights is uh, is somehow uh, not inherently uh, a good thing to want, <laughs> that that's a troublemaking situation, that you right. have to problematize the people on the ground uh, rather than talk to them in an authentic way. Um, and it reminds me uh, of, um, so in my, uh, and I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but it, uh, in the graphic novel uh, that I'm writing right now. That was my next question. Go uh -huh. ahead and jump ahead. Yeah. Uh, in breaking the news, I we can we can talk a little more about that. I just want to tell one story from it, which is that um, there's a, a chapter in it. It's media literacy graphic novel, and there's a chapter in it about narratives around race. Um, well, no, that's not the main chapter, but the, I don't remember what. Oh no, sorry. The chapter is on framing, how news gets framed, how pop culture narratives get framed, and um, how those frames help us either see or or um, put uh, sort of blinders over our eyes to, that prevent us from seeing clearly what a community or an issue uh, really is all about. And um, I opened that story, um, that chapter with a discussion of, or rather, I don't open it, the, the main deep dive in that framing chapter is a compare and contrast of the New York Times coverage of Michael Brown when he was murdered in Ferguson uh, versus the, the profile of him versus the profile of him in this, uh, I think it was the St. Louis Post-Gazette. Um, I could be getting the outlet wrong. It's been many, many months since I wrote that chapter. But the, the titles, the headlines of those pieces, even just the headlines, you can understand the, the humanization versus the dehumanization in the frame. The headline in the New York Times was, Michael Brown was no angel. And wow. the headline in the local newspaper was, Michael Brown was a gentle giant. And then the stories, as you might imagine, were built around the, even though the headlines, as you and I know, as, a, as journalists, the headlines are not usually written by the people who write no. them. Exactly, uh, And the headlines can often mislead what the story is actually about. But in those cases, the stories really, um, uh, some, the headlines summed up the frames of the stories. The New York Times uh, asked, you know, told stories from a, uh, one story from one time in, in his school, he was accused of stealing something. And then his mom came in and showed the receipt and it showed that he didn't steal the thing in the first place no context just he was accused of theft like mm. and and one after another pieces of information that could bias a reader toward thinking he deserved to be considered suspicious and then killed um in the did you look did you look in the report who was the reporter was it a local reporter in the local news and then you had a yeah a, a parachuter I, going in i, I believe New York so, Times. yeah i wanted to mention it i don't remember for sure if it wasn't it could have been a local person but it from the times that i really doubt it um yeah. but but the but even if it was even if the person happened to be local they were not part of the that community in terms of they weren't part of the um of the community they were reporting upon so uh, so yeah so you you were going to ask me so I, sorry for <laughs> yeah no 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 i'm glad you gave that concrete these are the kind of concrete examples that i think people can really relate to and understand what it what it means because you know we we studied a lot of theory in hampshire 
and and journalism is the way that I was able to put that theory to practice, whether it was reading Habermas or Hegel, which a lot of you guys are doing and banging your head against the wall, or or, or Said's Orientalism and stuff, you know. But this this stuff that that stuff that I learned actually we you do put it to practice and how you cover the news, especially as a journalist um, on the ground, you know, it makes a difference. So what you're talking to me about is really important. I mean, you, this book that you're writing, first of all, I'm really, congratulations. I'm really excited to read it. Uh, my kids love, love graphic no novels. So I'm definitely going to get it for my 13 year old. Um, why this? It's, it's the first of its kind, never been a, on this subject, media literacy. What made you want to, you know, what made you want to use this medium rather than writing another book in a more traditional style? And beyond that, what is media literacy, really? I mean, break it down for us. Um, you know, what critical tools we should use to become more active, critical media consumers? I mean, that, that's kind of how I want to know more about that. Okay. Um, so uh, so I, I never thought I would be doing a graphic novel. I, I have a very odd and rare condition called aphantasia, which means I have no mind's eye and blind in my eye. Like it, it's a, it's a recently sort of termed condition where it usually, if you tell somebody, you know, close your eyes, picture a beach, what does the beach look like? Is there, it's a, you can picture all sorts of things. You can, if you close your eyes, you can picture your, your parent or your spouse or your kid as if it's an image. I, I have nothing, just darkness. There's no, I, I, do, I cannot think visually. Oh or I cannot see visually anything that I just don't see with my eyes. So I never thought I would do a graphic novel, but the, but the, uh, the opportunity fell in my lap because they came to me because First Second Press is a publisher of graphic novels and the head of First Second Press um, wanted to create, a, he was creating a side uh, line, a series called World Citizen Comics that was, uh, in addition to all the other graphic novels that they do, was going to focus on citizen, uh, civic engagement. So there's, as part of their series, there's one on um, how to fix a broken democracy called Unrig. There's, um, there's a variety of different approaches. Dan Rather is going to be doing one with, uh, I believe, Dan Rather and Seth Abramson, maybe, or Dan Rather and somebody oh. um, are, are doing graphic novel with this series. And so they wanted one on media literacy. And I at first said, no, what do I know about visual whatever? And they're like, don't worry, we'll pair you with an artist. Um, and I, what I ended up realizing was I couldn't pass up the opportunity to get outside the choir. Um, that's something that we talk, started talking about. I think you probably all still talk about it in Hampshire a lot, right? How do you bring critical ideas about media justice, about gender justice, about racial justice, economic justice, queer theory, whatever the focus that you have is, how do you get that I, those sets of ideas outside of academia, outside of the activist movement even, right? How do you get average people to come along? And I feel like with a graphic novel, um, a format that's never really been used in this way, um, I have the opportunity to reach people who'd never read a book like Reality Bites Back because there's a lot of words in Reality <laughs> Bites Back, right? Um, now I'm writing, I'm writing a very dense nonfiction example filled approach to media literacy, but I'm also writing it as a script with images that I'm asking the artist to create. Um, and so, you know, it, it's a challenge. I will say it's, it's one of the hardest things I've ever done, um, but it's fun. And it's fun because um, of the opportunity, the potential to get people thinking much more critically about those tools that you asked about. So media right. literacy is, um, is basically, uh, a system of uh, it's a it's a way to bring critical thinking to everything that we engage with in media and to define media in a broad way media is not just um, media is not singular right I always talk about media are right so media are newspapers and magazines and TV and radio but they're also podcasts and they're also independent zines and they're also uh, marketing copy on cereal boxes in the supermarket and they're also um, billboards on the side of the road. Um, media is anything with words and image, text and images that uh, imply, that uh, give off a message, right? And so media, li media literacy offer tools, offers tools and a, sort of a, a framework through which you can deconstruct those messages. You can be more critical and aware of what you're taking in. So for example, um, 
when you're trying to figure out um, why, have, have you ever, I'm sure, I'm sure you have um, even just personally, but especially as a mom with kids, right? Have you ever mm-hmm. watched a TV show or a movie with your daughters and you're like, something yeah. doesn't feel right about this. <laughs> like, Most of the things watch. I watch. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. Some of us like can look at that and be very clear about what we feel is, is, you know, what's wrong with a particular thing that we're watching in pop culture. It might be a little harder to know exactly what it is that we feel is off about a piece of news. It might also be difficult to feel, to figure out what makes us uncomfortable about a, a movie or a song or a video, right? Um, if we have, if we bring a, a critical media literacy lens to those pieces of media that we're taking in, if we ask ourselves things like, who created this message? Who is this message aimed at? Who do we assume the target audience for this message is? Do we have a sense of the race or the gender or the class background of the target audience? Does that target audience in the minds of the media outlets that have created this image or this message, does that target audience change the content and the way the content is constructed? Do we have a sense of how? Um, If it's news, Um, Do we get a sense that there are more than one kind of source, you know, are there more than one kind of source being uh, addressed in the story? You know, if it's a story about um, economics, are you only hearing from people from Wall Street? Are you only hearing from the Fed? Are you also hearing from people who have a variety of academic or, um, or economic justice backgrounds? Are is that nuanced reporting happening in that story? Um, if it's a, if it's a if it's a reality TV show, right? Um, if the text that, that here's another key premise in media literacy to be able to separate text from subtext. If the text of a show like The Bachelor is the text says we're here to find true love for one guy and 25 out of 25 women, and and you know it's a search for a fairy tale. But the subtext is 25 women are every week uh, or every season, they bring in 20 to 30 women to compete for the quote unquote love of some dude they've never met before. Um, And the dude is every single season called Mr. Right because he seems wealthy and because he has frankly, a firm ass and a firm financial portfolio. Um, And that's all it takes to be Mr. Right right? That's all. That's all you need. You don't need loyalty. You don't need kindness. You don't need intelligence. You don't need to be progressive or uh, a a sort of a feminist minded person who respects women. You don't need any of that. You just need a good butt and a good bank account. Um, And for the women, um, all you need is to be willing to be publicly humiliated on the regular. You need to, you need to want to move from your, like, the narrative is consistent since 2002 when The Bachelor first debuted till now, they constantly have uh, the presumption that The Bachelor will stay wherever his city is and the woman he chooses will wanna move to where he is. She'll leave her family, she'll leave her job, she'll leave her thing for him because he's Mr. Right. On The Bachelorette, the spinoff franchise where the woman, the text is that the woman is supposed to quote, have all the power, the same assumption is often made that the men will want that bachelorette to who's supposedly choosing among all of them, but the men are never, it's never assumed they will leave their jobs or their careers, their families or their community and their friends to go to where the woman is. Um, But more than that, these tropes around, um, you know, women cannot feel complete without some guy choosing them. There's no agency for women romantically, sexually, um, intellectually. That intellect is not important for women, only um, only looks. Um, that, uh, you know, and you see that even in, in things like, you know, the men usually have a particular set of jobs on The Bachelor to be chosen as a star. They're uh, a pilot, they're an athlete, they're a banker, they're a, you know, finance guy, et cetera. And the women they date have, th- uh, you know, are ID'd as, you know, you know, Katie, dog walker, um, you know, uh, Kaylee, uh, um, you know, um, <laughs> yeah. like their interests, like it's very rare. Once in a while, they'll have somebody who has a career, but very rarely. And it, these kinds of, these kinds of structural things are the, are 
the subtext. And so if you see regularly, the text is, this is gonna be true love and it's a fairy tale, but the subtext is constantly women crying and, and women being perceived mm -hmm. at, framed as catty and gold diggers and bitchy and et cetera. And then, it's, it's, it's exported. That's what I want to say. Yeah. Those shows are going to Russia and being copied, going to Afghanistan, even being copied, coming to Turkey. Yeah. And so that narrative, and, and then it's, it's almost like marketed as Western. Here's something that's uh, progressive even in countries like this, but really it, it's worse than even the traditional roles women have in their homes here for what you're seeing, because and it brings on that extra pressure, right? Absolutely. And that's why I was talking about reality TV as backlash against gender and racial justice. But to, yeah. to bring it to the media literacy piece is just that um, if we are, if we can condition ourselves to think about what is the text versus what is the subtext, if we can think about who are the messages created for, how would the messages shift if a more diverse set of people or populations were used as sources in news for this story or as the cast members of a particular show? Um, what is, what is, who is creating the message? That's another thing to think about with media literacy. Is the writer's room of your TV show staffed mostly by white men? Um, it, are there women of color in the writer's room? Are there, um, are there young people in the writer's room? Are it, if, if, a, if a movie is a, about, um, has a plot about autism, are there any autistic people in the creation of the show? Or is it just people who don't have any expertise with autism deciding they're gonna make a show about autism um, or a movie about, you know? So these are the kinds of questions, there's so many, but these are just sort of the beginnings of, of ways that you can bring critical thinking to the engagement level of media. And the last thing I'll say that about that is just that um, a, a good rule to keep in your mind is uh, there's no such thing as mindless entertainment. We all, we all, and, and there's never a good time to quote, turn your brain off when you're watching media. It doesn't mean you can't have fun with it. And it doesn't mean you can't use media to enjoy yourself and relax. I do all the time. I'm not just a media critic, I'm a media fan. Um, I will admit that, but we have to keep our brains on. We have to keep that critical filter on because when it's off, that's when we're subject to disinformation, to biased messages, narratives, subtext, et cetera. Good point, because a lot of people are like, I just want to come home and watch something and not think. Right. Um, but they're constantly taking in information, right? So Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I want to go back to um, a little bit uh, about, we've talked a little bit about pop culture, but I want to go back to, uh, to journalism and in particular your experience with um, both, uh, you've done long form print journalism and you've recently launched this podcast on spec. Um, and throughout all of your work over the years, you've exposed various forms of abuse and corruption. You've told stories um, that are often about marginalized people at um, who are not at the center of telling their own stories. Um, so in general, but you have allowed that kind of uh, approach to bubble to the surface in your reporting. So. Um, I think you've mentioned this a little bit before, but um, how much uh, does being an insider of a community matter um, when you cover the news? And uh, can you tell us any uh, any examples of stories in which um, your, uh, your uh, willingness and going the extra mile to give people their own authentic voice in the story improved journalism as opposed to what you were I think alluding to before which is this yeah. idea that sort of white men have been the sort of neutral voice that considered a neutral voice in journalism that that we uh consistently have had this idea that journalism um is is objective mm -hmm. if it is through the lens of traditionally the people who owned and were employed by news who were white men right right so um, I mean I've I've gone through different journeys uh, of sort of discrimination in the news business. Obviously, what I do back when I started, you know, foreign correspondence, which is in the early 2000s and even before late 90s, um, I parachuted into Pakistan in my own homeland to go and, you know, and report literally undercover in a burqa. But uh, back then, the newsrooms were mostly white men. And things, like I said, things are changing. And I think that the quality of the reporting in some ways is changing as well. So when you have people, okay, I'll give you an example into my own sort of link. I, 
you know, when I was in Afghanistan um, reporting for seven years, I was, I was Afghan and yet I was also American. So I had amazing access to this society that a white man, white man cannot have, that any man cannot have, because it's a, in terms of women, it's, it's a very close society. You can't go into a, a female household in Kandahar you know, in South, in Southern Afghanistan and report, they wouldn't let you. So a lot of these books that have been written by, you know, by white men are pretty much about Afghan men and that's it. You, you don't get much. Um, so like being a woman actually really helped. And I think even women, other women who've gone in say this, um, and they give you this leeway that, okay, they don't hold you. I was not bound by Afghan women rules because I was coming from America. So I really had the best of both worlds in being able to report and so much access because the central government at that point was so weak, they couldn't stop us from doing what we wanted to do. I mean, we could go to prisons, we could go to hospitals, we could go anywhere we wanted. And, you know, I, I spent a lot of time, time with drug dealers and drug addicts and opium farms for my book, Opium Nation. Uh, and what it, why does it make a difference that I was from there? Well, just first of all, again, the language. There were, I have witnessed people who don't speak the language. I've witnessed people mistranslating and then that coming out on national television in America. And the kind of messages that, that are, that, 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 I mean, the mistranslations are so deep. You have no idea, you know? So when you're standing there and you're all covering the same press conference and then they come out to getting a whole different meaning than you do, it's, it's appalling, right? And sometimes they'll hire people who are not qualified. They don't know the right guides, I call them. And in the field, they're called fixers. Um, the other thing is that emotional connection you have. Mm. So I, you know, I have, I, when I report something like you, it's a life and death experience. I have friends in Afghanistan who are on a target assassination list right now. I've been losing friends one by one. Just, just last week, we had two, uh, they had just graduated high school. They were starting a uh, journalism and, and the Taliban are now targeting soft targets. They're, they're going, they've got a list and they're just getting rid of these women one by one that they feel they'll, they'll be a threat once the US leaves. Yeah. So there's an emotional connection that I can't just let go of. Whereas, and I, like, I don't know if you, any of you guys watched PBS, but Jane Ferguson is an excellent reporter. I think she comes from an Irish background and she tries really hard to do a good job. but she had interviewed a lot of the same people that every other person goes in Kabul and interviews. There was no, that because they all hire the same people and a lot of them just want, especially if it's TV, they want English speakers. Americans are too lazy and Europeans are not as bad, I have to say, with uh, uh, subtitles, with voiceovers. They want only English speakers. So when you go to a country like Turkey or Afghanistan or Yemen and you want only English speakers, you're gonna be getting the same exact narrative over and over and over again. So it's very basic logistical things like this that skew the story. Um, so that that's one thing. And she did a great job. I liked her stories, but I just kept seeing the same people saying the same thing. There was very little uh, variety into what was happening. Uh, so that's just some of the examples uh, of, of what it make, how it makes a difference. I think you put more effort in if you're an insider. Again, the outsider perspective is also important. I think one of the things I do want to talk about, if you're an insider, one of the pitfalls of being an insider is a lot of times we do end up taking sides. Okay, there is, uh, there is sort of, and and a lot of editors will say, I've heard them say, I don't want to hire a local because we think they're connected with that local warlord or the, their pro-government person, what we're hearing, seeing them. And, and there's truth to that. So you have to be careful who you're going to hire. Now, as you know, I'm on the other side of things. I'm managing a, a podcast, a news podcast, and I'm doing the hiring. I'm on the management side now. And I've now started to think differently about how to handle this situation because I see the same kinds of problems with hiring local reporters. What does it mean? Who are the local reporters? How do you vet them? How do you know they're not making up news? And it's not just locals, the foreigners will do the same. So 
Yeah. I was going to say that I'm glad that you brought up because that, that was going to be my last question for you is about um, about on spec and I wanted to ask you about sort of why you decided to launch this podcast and what the differences are between the print journalism you've done and the podcast are there any um, sort of teachable moments from the podcast that you've started to uh, that you could share with us. Sure. I went from print magazine to podcasting because I saw that few, fewer people are reading and more and more people are listening. And I really love radio. I started out radio a while back with Free Speech Radio News on the Pacifica Network and started doing stuff for NPR and, and, and now PRIs the world. And then a group of friends got together in Istanbul, freelancers. I've always been a freelancer for a very long time. I think I only had a job for two years. Why? Freelancing is not fun. I wear a lot of different hats to survive, right? But because I'm extremely independent, I don't like to be told what to write. And I, being a mom is my first priority. So I have my own, I'm in charge of my own hours. But with the podcast, we were kind of really sick and tired of being told when we were pitching stories that there had to be an American or Western angle to our stories. And that, again, skews what you get. It tells us the stories we're, we're getting, whether it's from Ethiopia or Eritrea, uh, they're not important enough unless the Americans are involved. Mm -hmm. And that's just a really, again, that's a really problematic lens into the world. Um, what are we learning about the, these, these people who are trying to migrate to other places? We don't really know them at all. And so we decided to, that a bunch of friends just got together, started this podcast. We didn't know what it was going to turn into. And now it's starting to pick up. We're going, you know, I'm hiring people from different parts of the world to do uh, documentaries, half hour documentaries, deep dives. And they're mostly local reporters because we want them to tell their own stories. And I've been training them. Um, and, you know, teachable moments for me have been, uh, it's there are not that many documentary audio, you know, this is, if you guys want to go into journalism, this really is a very, there's a lot of room for this, especially in foreign, you know, in foreign countries to go in and learn about these places. Um, and, uh, and I have to train like crazy to, to make sure, you know, it's very different doing a BBC three minute story than doing a half hour documentary with a 5,000, 6,000 word script. Yeah. So that has been my main challenge, but also it's dangerous. The locals have a lot to lose. You're hiring a, a local reporter versus someone who's gonna who's got a foreign passport and just can take off. You know, we just had somebody in Hong Kong get arrested, and so I've had to deal with a lot of damage control on this. But um, onspecpodcast.com, that's uh, we just revamped our whole visual identity. Would love it if you guys would listen if you're interested in stories that are sort of beyond your borders, with a, you know, with a deeper dive. It kind of connects you to the world. And we're covering a lot of issues that connect us. Um, I'd love to get feedback from everyone. So okay. I think, I mean, are we are we good with time or? Um, Karen, are we, uh, do we have a bunch of questions or do you want us to keep talking? There are a couple of questions. So should okay. we start with those? I think, what, I, I just want to add one thing at the end of uh, uh, um, touching on what Freeba just said. Uh, your, your comment about, uh, news outlets constantly wanting an American slant. Um, yeah. That's uh, that is also the case. I, the one thing we didn't talk a lot about so far is corporate media ownership, and that's another piece of media literacy that is incredibly important: media economics and corporate media ownership. And uh, the way that that connects in this particular example is um, that uh, you know if you look at CNN US you'll get an entirely different slate of stories about a particular country um, than if you look at CNN in that country. The same exact news outlet, different bureaus, right? I'm not even talking about different, different media entities, um, but uh, American news outlets, American owned media companies, which by the way, we only have a handful of owners of everything we see, watch, read, and hear in news, print news, broadcast news, radio, et cetera. Um, last I checked, it was five, six. It's, it's consolidating so quickly now that I lose track, frankly. Wow. Um, yeah, but, it, but there's, there's both the fact that, uh, 
if you look for example, I'm only using CNN because it's the first thing that came to mind, but same thing with uh, international print bureau, print editions of different newspapers or magazines. If you compare the, uh, the take locally on the ground in other countries to a particular uprising or a particular um, economic issue um, or a racial issue, uh, it will often be a lot more critical and, uh, and sort of deep dive in the international bureaus. And then when you get that story here, it's a very us versus them lens. Yeah. Often. Absolutely. It's very yeah. often. Look at those awful things happening over there. Let's not talk about the fact that we have a lot of those same yeah. things awfully happening here. Look at our environmental problems. Look at our, you know, don't rather, sorry, don't look at our environmental problems. Don't look at our rampant level of domestic violence and homicides of women. Uh, by their husbands and their ex-boyfriends and et cetera in this country. But look at how terrible it is that women face violence in the Middle East. Yeah. Um, look at, you know, don't look at the fact that we, even before now, it's the one difference in, uh, in the last year or so, um, even in particular the last couple of months after the coup attempt, we're finally in American media talking a little bit about right-wing white supremacy, Aryan nation type, uh, quote unquote militia groups, even though they're not actually militia, um, as terrorists. But, you know, as a media critic, I've been talking about that since the 90s, right? Yeah, um, yeah. You were saying before about freelancing, you know, I, I've when I started talking about some of these issues uh, and how media could, for example, how American media should cover uh, uh, mass shootings and how they should cover mass shootings in the context of violence against women because most of the mass shootings were motivated specifically by men who were stalking one woman or who were rejected by one woman and they were mad and then they went and shot up a health club or a school or an office. But that was always left out of the story. And maybe it was a tiny little detail, but the headlines never really focused on it. And instead, I mean, it was 1998 when I first yeah. was talking about that talk. And I tried to pitch every news outlet in the country. Well, not ever. I didn't try to pitch every day, but I tried to pitch a lot of news outlets um, talking about how if we didn't name it as, yeah. as a motive, these crimes would continue to, to increase and media would be complicit because the average person and law enforcement too wouldn't know the signs to look out for. I could not get that piece placed anywhere. I ended wow. up putting it for Sojourner, a feminist newspaper that at the time was the longest running uh, continual feminist newspaper in the country. It no longer exists anymore. We've lost most of the feminist newspapers, but, um, but they printed it in 98. I had to print a version of that story over and over, a new version of that story every time another pe another mass shooting happened and another, it, it was not until Elliot Roger shot, um, left that anti-woman uh, manifesto in, San in um, California a few years back saying how he wanted to kill all of those women because they wouldn't have sex with him. Um, and he killed a whole lot of women and a bunch of men and left a video manifesto about it before media would cover that. And in similar to um, this thing of the coup, right? We, yeah. in American corporate news outlets, we like to cover international coups and we like to cover international authoritarianism. And we've had authoritarianism here for five years. Um, the attempt at during the campaign, uh, all the signs were there. Um, and we didn't want to talk about it as authoritarianism in, in American corporate no. media. No, anyway. I mean, but I think it's important to say, okay, what, how do we cover it? How do we cover it? Um, the way that we're doing it on spec is we are looking at these global issues with a local angle, but they're really global issues where, you know, th this is the thing that people that Americans don't often realize is that domestic violence is everywhere. And how is the difference? We need to know how it's different, how the stats are what it means from, from Turkey to, to America and how people are dealing with it differently, but it's there. And I think we need to cover things from that global lens rather than this very tiny parochial lens. So when you and I talk, I don't want people to think what we're saying is close inward. You know, let's just talk about it. That's not what we're saying. What we're saying is broaden it out, but make sure you cover the nuances of those local stories, right? Broaden it out. We are all dealing with very similar issues now in this global village that we're in from climate change to disinformation. 
Um, and and let's let's end with that. I think yes. we can open the questions. Uh, it's been fun talking. <laughs> Jen can and I can go on forever, but we'd love to hear from you guys. <laughs> Um, so I'm pulling one question that showed up in the chat. Um, it was from Barbara. She said, could you explain the story of the CNN friend you mentioned? I'm thinking this is about Rukmini Kalamaki from the New York Times, but if oh, I got okay. that wrong, Barbara, please post a note about that in the chat. Do you want to answer it that way? Sure, sure. want to move on sure. to other questions? If I um, if I said CNN, it was a mistake. I apologize. It was the New York Times, and it was a podcast called Caliphate, and it became a big blitzkrieg of media, sort of attacking Rukmini, almost like a witch hunt um, about her. Uh, her source burned her. The person in that podcast, uh, which was a New York Times uh, produced award winning Peabody uh, podcast, uh, lied about being an ISIS member and he's a brilliant actor and it can happen to any of us. So I didn't appreciate how the media sort of honed in on Rukmini and attacked her for it. But I think that there were lessons in that and she talks about it on her Twitter and she says, I, you know, I, I should have been more careful. But also one of the things that I, you know, that I did see and it's not just Rukmini, that's the thing. It's not just Rukmini, but a lot of different reporters go in with this narrative you know, of, okay, this is the story I want to get, especially if it's a long form, right? A lot of us were, the times we're asked to sort of plan the story out. What do you think you're going to get on the ground? And I almost think that, okay, it's good to be prepared. For, but when you do that, you really don't allow for the element of surprise. Um, and sometimes that narrative, it just isn't there. And you got to let go, you know, you got to let go and you got to chase the story that is there, even if it's not what your editors want. Um, in, in Rukmini's case, I think if you guys read about it, you'll see that there was a lot of press criticism against her. Um, and some of it I, I may be okay with, but a lot of it I thought it was the, the, the bigger lesson in that was, let's not just talk about Rukmini, let's talk about the bigger problem. Uh, why, how do we need to check more, fact check more? Uh, how do we treat our so-called fixers? Even that term is offensive to local journalists who are helping us. There are eyes and ears here. I've been working with one woman, uh, Uzge Sabzeji, who's a photographer here, and I trust her judgment more than myself when it comes to Turkish politics and issues, because she knows, she's reading, she's the one reading it uh, all the time. So uh, when she tells me don't, just recently I did a story for Nightline and a radio story for Reveal, and it was a murder mystery about this one American, Syrian American journalist and her mother who were killed in Istanbul. And I was really close to solving this, I thought, and I wanted to just keep digging. And my local, my Syrian translators were women with me. They're, you know, they're like, Fariba, you're getting, this is too dangerous. We need to stop. We can't go, you know, we really think you also need to stop. There's no security here. Uh, you know, regimes will just <laughs> reach out and kill in Turkey. You know, you're not safe here. And I have kids here, right? So I, I had to stop myself um, because if they're telling me it's not safe, who am I to say it is? Because I want I want to solve this thing because I'm obsessed with this story, which was a two year long investigation. So that's kind of what that story is. Sorry, went on for too long. Any other questions? Yes, there are more. Jen, there's one for you about, um, do you know when your graphic novel will be published? Um, the pandemic threw a bit of a wrench uh, into the process, so I don't have a specific pub date. Um, I should have been done writing it by now, but I am not. Um, uh, my new delivery date is toward the end of 2021, so it'll probably be out sort of early or mid 2022, I think. I don't know the exact date, um, but follow. Uh, I'll definitely post about it on Facebook and Twitter the one I know. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I am very rarely on Twitter these days, but I am J-E-N-N-P-O-Z-N-E-R at Twitter. And um, I respond, it, I will only see things if you tag me in the question, because um, I, I left because of around eight or nine years of daily rape threats was sort of enough for me. Um, I basically uh, got out of Twitter for that, but I'm, I'm much more active on Facebook. Um, but feel free to reach out to me in either of those or in the Hampshire alumni group um, if you want to know more. Um, 
yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, what thoughts do you have about how to increase media literacy among young people? Ah, okay. Great well, that, that's, a, that's a, an easier one for me to answer. Although, I mean, I will preface this by saying we could spend an hour just on that question and just have the tip of the iceberg. I do four hour workshops sometimes on media literacy. Um, I, will, I will mention that uh, oh, I can't reach it without getting up and showing you I'm only wearing jeans. Um, <laughs> Uh, in my book, Reality Bites Back, uh, I have a whole chapter at the end of the book called Fun with Media Literacy. And I had to argue with my editors at the time um, to allow me to include this sort of workshoppy uh, chapter at the end because it's otherwise just a very traditional analytical book. Um, but I thought it was really important to give people something to do. A lot of the time, I feel like one of a big failure in uh, um, in activist spaces is we love to depress and run. Like, hey, here's everything that's wrong with the world. Everything that's wrong with this issue. Bye. <laughs> you know, like, um, care so much about it. Be really afraid about it. I gotta go now. Um, so I didn't want to do that. Um, so in the in that chapter, I have I. And it's, it's very tailored to reality television because that's what the book is, but it's also all the tools that I offer in that chapter can be uh, sort of translated to news media as well. So there are uh, Mad Libs, there are drinking games, there are um, deconstruction questions. The idea is to, for me, I think, one of the main ways to uh, increase media literacy among young people is to get, get young people to understand that you're not judging them for what they enjoy. Um, there's a huge, and that's not just only for young people, there's a huge resistance that I've seen um, when I do keynotes at colleges. Uh, it's not just the students who res are resistant sometimes, sometimes the professors too. They'll be super open to a media literacy approach or media critic, a, a media criticism approach to a variety of different forms of media. But if you get the one show that they like, if you talk about the one music artist they like, if you talk about the one video game they like, all of a sudden you're saying, you get questions like, I'm not stupid. Why did you say I'm stupid? I never said you're stupid. I never said anything about the viewers at all. I talked about the structural issues within this particular text and subtext. And you're saying, you're, it's because we identify so strongly with the media that we enjoy. We personalize it. So a lot of the time, if you go in to a conversation with a young person or even with your, you know, your parents um, about what feels a little off about a particular piece of media or about why you should be more critical about that piece of media, um, you'll get this, uh, this pushback of, no, it's fine. It doesn't mean anything. It's just TV or it's just a music or it's just a video game. It's just a, um, instead, if you can say, hey, this is really fun there is pleasure to be had in engaging with media. That's why we engage with it. But we need to keep our critical filters on and here are some ways we can do that while also having fun. So for example, one of, when I do a, a workshop on, um, on media literacy, specifically around reality TV, I, uh, I, cr I give out blank, this is before social media made bingo cards go viral. This is like 12 years ago, I started, 13, 14 years ago, I started doing blank bingo cards that people would fill in. I would ask them, what are the stereotypes? What are the scenes? What are the kinds of characters? What are the kinds of tropes that you see a lot in these shows? And people would put pieces of dialogue in the the bingo squares and they'd put, you know, girl cries for no reason in a bingo square. They'd put, you know, uh, black person is seen as suspicious in a bingo square. They'd put, um, you know, uh, any, any number of quotes or scenarios that come up a lot. And then we'd watch something together. We'd watch a show, a half an hour of a show. And the goal was anytime you see something on the bingo card, you call it out. So everybody in the room actually notices the thing that is problematic, right? And then, you know, you give you know, whoever gets bingo first gets a prize, but it's, it's a way to have fun while can, thinking critically. Um, there are lots of other ideas in the book, but uh, the main thing also is um, to have these very key questions in mind. Who created the message? What's the text? What's the subtext? How would it be different if there are different people involved? Who owns it? Who's profiting from it? Um, Etc. I want you to rate every show I watched. <laughs> 
<laughs> so I just I just binged watched um, How to Get Away with Murder, all six oh. seasons of it. And well, I was, <laughs> we can talk about it afterwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm really curious. I want to know what I was being duped into. If somebody wants to do a, if somebody wants to fund a second podcast of you and me just uh, talking yeah. about like the pop culture stuff we like or don't like, I am in. <laughs> totally, I would love it. I think it would be so much fun and probably get a lot more listeners than on spec because <laughs> <laughs> because people don't like to take their medicine. Yeah, basically, basically, <laughs> yeah. Karen, do we have any more questions? Um, there are a few more questions. One of them has a bunch of parts to it. So I'll direct this one to you, Fariba, since Jen just sure. did the last one. What faculty did you work with at Hampshire? What was your Div 3? And the most difficult transitions for you vis-a-vis um, -vis your Hampshire ideas and how you should become a reporter versus the reality of what you faced once you were in the field? Okay, great questions coming from a student, I imagine. Um, okay, so I decided to be a journalist when I was 12 years old. So I think I'm an anomaly that way. And it was, I always say it was a calling, not a choice. So it, I knew very early on that this is what I was going to do, specifically foreign, foreign reporting, because I always wanted to go back to Afghanistan. Um, and I, but it wasn't just that I wanted to uh, travel. So I think when I came to Hampshire, um, I, I came partly because I got a full scholarship and because I loved Amherst and, you know, I had read Emily Dickinson and, and I didn't know much else about Hampshire until I, I stayed there. And I found myself very isolated initially because I was coming this, from this very conservative Afghan community in California called Little Kabul. We call it that. It's Fremont, California. And, you know, where there were sex segregated parties and all of a sudden I was in the middle of a university where condoms were being passed out in the bathrooms and there were, <laughs> and so boys were wearing skirts and, you know, so, and girls weren't shaving their legs. So it was a very different environment for me. But in terms of the career choice, I, I think that I don't remember, it's been such a long time. I remember, you know, I did a, a interdisciplinary, which was Middle Eastern studies and journalism. And then five years later, after working in the field, I took that exact same thing to NYU. And I did a double major at the Kevorkian Center in NYU. Um, so I think my div three was on, it was called, I think you'll find in the library. It's also on my website, which is very, very old, but uh, it's called Afghan Couples. Um, a study of shifting gender and identity. I had interviewed, I think, 17 couples and to understand how they were changing, who were people who, you know, couples who were uh, in the US and they were starting to understand themselves uh, as women and how they didn't belong to men. And so five years into that study, and I followed that even after I finished college, that was my thesis, um, half of those couples had already broken up. And the, most of the reasons for it was basically just straight up sexism. Um, so that was my div three. It was very much part of my journey of an identity journey of an, as an Afghan American, what it meant to, you know, to be exposed to all kinds of gender identities. Um, I remember, I think my advisor was Ali Mir Sipasi, who is an Iranian American. He's at, I think he's at NYU now. Um, I worked with someone named David in journalism. We didn't have that many journalism classes. We had an adjunct lecture, lecturer with both uh, Jennifer and I were just in love with, and we'd love to connect with her name, Janet Kay. She yeah. was one of the few who taught, we had, very, you know, we had these um, very few journalism classes. So I would take any that came through. Um, and then I think, yeah. You take, um, were you in the journalism class with the, I don't remember his name, but he was the editor of the local, I think the Daily Hampshire Gazette. Yes, yes. I don't remember his name either. See, it's that been such a long time. time. It's hard to say. Yeah. And I learned, time. Yeah, it was a good class. So we kind of got the basics of when, what, where, and why. And uh, that was important. That was important. How I took my Hampshire, I mean, this is a really good question. How did I uh, make this very sort of ivory tower theoretical education and, you know, and, and incorporate it into my journalism? I think that that whole concept of a narrative going into a country um, and, and going into various communities it's, it's just letting go of that and coming in with a clean slate and saying, teach me, I need to know. I don't know anything. I need to know more and, and not being afraid to say that. 
uh, you know, and also understanding something else that identity matters when you're in this part of the world, especially. Um, look, so I look white, like I said, and I have blonde hair, which is from being an albino, right? So I'm legally blind. Um, and people don't know these things. So all kinds of uh, <laughs> stereotypes and preconceptions of who I am come into play when we talk. And I know that, right? When I'm sitting in a taxi driver and I'm about to have a political conversation with a, with a Turkish cab driver, I already know a lot of times what he's about to ask me. It's on key. Where are you from? Are you Muslim? What do you do here? And then, you know, 90% of the time they think I'm a spy. So you have to be prepared for those things. And it's a very dangerous thing to say that, you know, to say, they, but that's just the conception. So you have to kind of be prepared for that, knowing the history of these countries and the colonialism that is here. You know, also I talk about language a lot. You know, English is a colonialist language, but it's no longer owned by the colonizer. On spec, we decided it's gonna be in English with you know, foreign language voiceovers because you have so many populations in this part of the world who now speak English from Hong Kong to India, to South Africa, to, to the Middle East. And they are consuming news in English now because they don't have independent media. Um, and so we are it, this is it. They also don't trust the mainstream news coming from America because they think it's extremely biased against them, which half the time they're right, as Jennifer pointed out. So all of that helps me understand, uh, knowing, studying that colonialist history in this part of the world helps me understand why people, where they're coming from and, and why I need to be sensitive of it and not take offense, right? I could easily take offense, but of course I have my red lines, you know, any kind of sexual <laughs> harassment and, and that happens often, but you, you have to navigate your way through it. I don't go, I don't report in Afghanistan, I couldn't report being touched on the street to the police. The police were the ones touching us. What I did do is go call up my neighbor and say, okay, you're going to beat up that guy? So you have to find different ways of talking and, and incorporating these cultural differences into your journalism. Um, so I think, again, I, I gave a long answer. <laughs> I think the next one is sort of related and maybe maybe you sort of answered it in that, but what kind of response do female journalists get these days in a male dominated industry who don't follow the Christiane Amanpour template and the CNN slant? Um, I know Christiane Amanpour can be quite controversial, but I do have a lot of respect for her because she broke a glass, glass ceiling for the rest of us, especially for those of us who are not coming from privileged white backgrounds. So um, on her political views, it's a whole other uh, subject. It's hard. I mean, <laughs> it is very, very hard. Yeah, you got to have really thick skin. Um, you, you have to come in prepared to, when I'm in the field, it's not about me. I lose myself, you know, and I will do all kinds of things that I wouldn't do in my personal life. Prime example, um, I will wear a headscarf. I will, you know, I will uh, go into a mosque and even pray if I have to. I, I will, you know, things that I don't normally do in my in my uh, in my social life or in my social circle. Um, and sometimes I don't share information in order to get access. Is that lying? No, I think that's part of being a journalist. They will ask me, "Do you drink?" Okay, and the way that I handle that because they will stop talking to me if I say I drink right? As a woman. If I was a man and I said I drink, eh, no problem. Men can do anything they want. Um, I'll say, well, you know, I don't find, you know, vodka or whiskey very, you know, something that I, that I really am fond of, which is not a lie, but it doesn't mean I drink. You see what I'm saying? So I, I don't drink. So I find ways to answer questions. And this is something that I'm very keen on, even on spec. One of the things that this podcast that I'm, you know, so my life has been taken over by is that the story, the reporter is part of the story. Who we are, our position, positionality makes a huge difference in the story that we get. You know, I'll, I'll guarantee you, send me a an, an Nigerian to Turkey to do the same story that I will do, and it will be different because of how people respond to us and how they see us. Um, and so I think we have to make ourselves part of that story. Uh, and so and this was a question that was geared at Jen Jennifer that I didn't get to ask about the myth of objectivity, 
there's, there's really no such thing. The best I, thing I could do as a journalist here is be as fair and as balanced as possible, but also as honest to say, look, I'm here as a foreigner. This is how many years I've been here. This is what I see and what I think. And here are the people I'm interviewing and their perspective on it and the history behind it. So um, some of the challenges I faced, uh, trolling is big, right? Um, this whole spy thing is quite dangerous. I mean, Turkey for journalists, as some of you know, is not easy. Even me talking, probably monitored right now. But I am very transparent. The people are like, get off WhatsApp. It's being monitored. Go to Signal. I don't. This is this is the way I deal with these things. I don't go to Signal. I don't go to Telegram. Uh, I have been on Telegram, and I've had problems with that because those things are encrypted more, and I don't have anything to hide. I don't have anything to hide from the government except my sources. And that if they want those, they, they can go after them a lot more easier uh, than they could in the US. You know, there aren't these laws where you protect your source. And I mean, it, it's a different world we're working in here. Um, yeah, so I think uh, being a woman journalist, it's it, the, it, in some ways you have more access, like I said, in, in more conservative societies where they'll allow you in. But uh, in other, in terms of safety and security, you're much more at risk. I, I would love to um, to jump in just base, just around the issue of objectivity that you mentioned. Um, yeah. A few things that you said uh, made me think of a few other things. And so, first, um, when you're saying that you know if somebody if if you're doing a story um, in Afghanistan or if you're doing a story in Turkey, it's going to be very different than somebody doing a story, that same story, uh, but from Nigeria or somebody doing that same story from France, right? Um, it reminds me actually of, I, I don't remember if, I don't remember for sure if this is where I learned this, but I think it was in that class um, with the editor of the Daily Hampshire Gazette, I'm pretty sure. Um, and it could have been later, I could be, but somebody so said- Sarah, Sarah Buttonweiser says in the- um... I, You froze. I can't hear you. Okay. Um, so uh, I think that, um, whatchamacallit, I think that it was the Daily Hampshire Gazette who was our teacher, but he, uh, or somebody else said uh, to think of uh, if you send some if you if you're doing a story about a fire, um, or actually now now I'm thinking maybe he was maybe I came up with this later in a workshop base whatever anyway if you're <laughs> if you're doing if you're an editor and you're sending somebody to uh, cover a fire right. The, a fire to me, the reason that, that I use the fire example is that it's the most sort of uh, kind of mundane. You don't, if you're a reader, you're not thinking that there are 27 different loaded political uh, implications of a fire. It's not, you know, initially you're not thinking it's a race issue or a gender issue, or it's it's not like you're doing a story on abortion or, or you know, police abuse. It's just a local arson, right? But- mm -hmm. If you send seven different people to cover that fire, you can come back with seven different stories because there's no one objective truth, right? Yeah, there, somebody, one reporter goes to the fire and they will uh, bring back a story that's very human interest. The lead will be about, you know, the little kid sitting on the side of the road with the charred teddy bear that was burned up in the fire and the kid is, the tears are running down the face and where's the family gonna live? And then you get into the fire from that family's story. Somebody else who's much more interested in local infrastructure might do a story based on how uh, the city, uh, city council recently slashed the fire department budget. And so it took the, the two towns over, the fire department came and instead of the local fire department that was closed. And that's, you know, the implications of the budget issues. There's are so many different ways to approach even a mundane non-political story, right? Or mm -hmm. not that many things are Precisely. It's right. a really putting a, a, a actual solid point about how how different it can be. Right. right. Yeah. And exactly. so then if we think about objectivity as if we under if we problematize the uh, the the one of the absolute mainstays of corporate journalism in America. I can't speak to journalism outside America, but one of the absolute mainstays of journalism here is that uh, is this myth of objectivity, this idea, well, what is just called objectivity that I call the myth of objectivity and that some other folks like Bob McChesney and others have, have 
called the myth of objectivity for years, which is that, um, you know, the idea that um, you can't have an opinion, that there is an, there is one sort of truth, and you have to find that truth, and that uh, underneath this idea of uh, of objectivity is journalists can separate themselves completely from any social issue. They can separate themselves completely from any opinion. Um, some newsrooms don't used to not even allow uh, or discourage journalists from voting. Um, many newsrooms still have uh, policies where journalists are not allowed in their personal time to donate to particular uh, candidates or nonprofits or go to rallies or et cetera. Um, the idea that journalists have to be some sort of robotic people without any kind of uh, opinions, any kind of feelings, it actually cannot happen. People, the, and and the, I believe that that myth of objectivity actually ends up uh, creating the opposite effect in news. Because when you are not thinking about your own implicit biases, when you're not thinking about your own opinions, when you're not thinking about the slants that you bring personally to a story based on your gender, your race, your geographic region, your age, uh, your work history, your family history, your history with or no history with law enforcement, whatever your particular identity, your health, your ability, ability or disability, whatever your uh, life circumstances are, everything has brought you to this one particular story. If you ignore that you have those ideas, then you're not thinking about going the extra mile to find sources who don't necessarily agree with you. Um, the other thing is the, the myth of objectivity has been based, as I, as I sort of alluded to earlier, in this notion that white men are the neutral American mm -hmm. and that all news is uh, is sort of shaped through and for this neutral American. That's the objective American is the white male lens is the one through which news stories get created. And I ran into this in my first year at Hampshire. I don't remember the name of the guy who was a teacher. He was a staff person. He wasn't, he wasn't uh, an adjunct. I only took one or two classes with him, but um, he was stuffy and he hadn't been in a newsroom for something like 20 years. I don't remember his name, um, but he had this, uh, we got into it in either my first semester or my second semester, we got into it because he believed that I should not be allowed to report on a story about abortion because he said I could not be objective about abortion. And I asked him why, and he said, because you're a woman. And I said, well, then who can report on stories about abortion? And he said, well, men because they're not emotionally attached to the issue, which is, first of all, of course men are emotionally attached to the abortion issue. Look at every single congressional hearing about how men want to control women's access to it, right? Yeah. That, and I wasn't going in saying I needed to do a commentary. I wanted to do a fair article, a, a news article about a public health issue. No, but women in general couldn't be objective. Yeah. But men could because men are the neutral men. And he, we went back and forth, even at Hampshire, with the idea that uh, journalism had to be objective and objective meant male. Um, so this is not just, so fast forward to 2020 from 1992 and that guy telling me, that Hampshire professor telling me that women couldn't be objective about abortion and I couldn't write that story. Fast forward to 2020 when black journalists were benched from covering Black Lives Matter protests because they couldn't be objective according to their newsrooms. Wow. Um, and I don't remember the specific names. There were two journalists in particular who talked about this, um, women journalists. Um, and it's, it's a continuing problem. And I think that needs to be, uh, very uh, decidedly and meticulously unpacked by every journalist because the goal shouldn't be objectivity. The goal should be fairness. The goal exactly. Should be authenticity. Exactly. The yeah. goal should be breadth of information and nuance and analysis and, uh, and various communities speaking in their own voices for their own interests. Exactly. And not being pigeonholed. I think that's another right. thing. You know, because my problem has been, oh, you're Afghan, so you're going to cover Afghanistan. It's like, no, no, I can do more than that. <laughs> I can. It might be from a different perspective. That's what I'm saying that anyone saying, don't parachute in. I'm going to parachute into Tunisia and Malaysia uh, in, in, in May. I'm going in for these stories that I'm doing with Nat Geo. 
and uh, I'll be the parachuter, but I'm trying to do as much research as possible, you know, to do the right thing, to, to write the right thing. But it'll be, I won't, I don't think it'll be the deepest dive. I know that already. And I'm going to be honest about it. Yeah. So. And that, that's a really interesting point too, that um, the, the pigeonholing thing. So one of the things that I uh, aimed to do when I founded Women in Media and News in the end of 2001, early 2002 was, um, I mean, the landscape was so different in media at that time. Not only was there not social media and not only were there no blogs really at that time yet um, influencing coverage, but there were very, very few women at all, not forget about feminists, there are just very few women of any political stripe doing op-eds uh, in the nation's newspapers and magazines um, as news sources on Sunday morning talk shows, as guests, as there, there were no feminist hosts of anything. Um, and so at the time, one of the goals of women in media and news was to increase women's presence and power in public debate. And at the time, uh, there were, you know, I had tons of statistics to marshal, but people would often say to me, well, is it, you know, will it change if we just get more women, just if we just made everything 50-50? And I was like, well, not exactly. We need diversity. We need inclusion. We need inclusion of, of women and people of color at every aspect, every level of the media. Um, and as you go up the ladder of media, you get fewer and fewer women and people of color in decision-making power positions. So in entry levels, it's much more equitable. Um, but by the time you get to newsroom managers, much fewer. By the time you get to the CEOs and the board of director suites, it's almost invisible for women and people of color in those power positions, in those clout titles. Um, but if you add, you know, one of my examples is if you just add women or people of color just for the sake of it, right, without that authenticity that you're talking about, without that connection to the issues and the, and the, um, the communities, then, you know, not a lot is going to change structurally because these problems are structural, right? So if you get, you know, if you put three more Ann Coulters on a corporate media board, is anything going to change in the way news content is created? Our story our idea is going to be very different from um, in the the studios, the TV and the movie studios. If you get, um, you know, if you, it, for example, Milo, whose last name I can never pronounce, um, if you put him in charge of uh, of story assignments in, in newsrooms because he's a gay man, is, is there going to be uh, a lot less homophobic coverage? No, he's a right-wing uh, provocateur. We need much more um, uh, holistic approaches to uh, not just pigeonholing on gender and race. The other aspect of the pigeonholing is that we need to allow women and people of color and queer people and trans people to report on and analyze and do pop culture stories that have uh, the whole breadth of humanity, not just about you know, women writing yeah. about women and you know, trans people yeah. writing about trans people. So one of the huge benefits that I've seen, well, huge, um, not benefits, um, uh, sort of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's a really basic word, brain freeze. Um, uh, pieces of progress uh, that we've seen in the last 10 years. Um, early 2000s, I, I did a QA and a and an interview with uh, Jennifer Finney Boylan, who is one of the first people who wrote a really um, engaging nonfiction, mainstream, uh, accessible uh, memoir about uh, coming out as trans as an older adult. Um, and at the time, there was a lot of media coverage of that book because uh, Jenny Boylan was a college professor and had been uh, a noted award-winning author for many years. So very articulate, very uh, witty, was in a band, like you know, great storyteller. So a really kind of media trained voice. Um, but there, was a ton there wasn't a lot of coverage that was respectful. It was all the same old uh, narratives of, um, you know, trans women are just men in dresses. Trans women are selfish for transitioning because their poor wives are left behind. Tra you know, all of those old and trans women just want to uh, do this for attention or want to be, um, you know, sort of uh, getting special rights that women have uh, because apparently men don't have enough rights. In the Whatever. And they just all these really terrible narratives. And Jenny was able to pierce those narratives with this very kind of. She lives in Maine, and this is very like. Uh, very basic uh, kind of here's my charming way of in a down home kind of uh, vernacular piercing through all these arguments without you thinking that I think you're stupid. Um, she's just really great at that. 
Um, but she said when we originally did our interview back in the day, early, like 2004 maybe, um, that she wanted to eventually and hopefully shortly not have to write about trans things all the time anymore. She would go back to just being a writer about any number of things. And fast forward, um, she ended up on the board of GLAAD um, and she did some really amazing work in pushing news narratives um, to expand around and be more uh, broad and encompassing around and respectful and nuanced around trans lives in America, um, both in news media and in pop culture. She ended up being an advisor on the I Am Kate reality show that Caitlyn Jenner had, which is, I believe, the only reason that that show was not an incredible shit show. Um, it was actually kind of subversive, but in part, in large part, because of Jenny Boylan's participation. But eventually, and this is where the progress comes in, the real progress comes in, I think, she's now a columnist for the New York Times and she writes about whatever she wants. So once in a while she writes about trans issues with passion and clarity and political zeal um, and accuracy, but she also writes about uh, dogs. She just had a book come out about, about dogs, a memoir related to dogs and life. And she writes about, uh, you know, mental health issues. She writes about violence. She writes about all sorts of things. And she just gets to write whatever she wants. She's not the trans writer at the times. Right. I think that's the important writer too. at times. Yeah. Because one of the reasons we chose journalism is to have this variety in our lives and learn new things. Right. I'm, you know, I'm heartbroken from Afghanistan. I don't want to cover it anymore. I've lost my hope in a lot of ways. So I want to move on and I'm being pulled, constantly pulled back in. Um, so anyway, I uh, was, was, is there more? So should we, yeah. are there more questions? I'm happy to answer them. So it's 9.40 p.m. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's pretty oh, late <laughs> for you. <laughs> We've passed 1.30. So I'm inclined to take this one last question because it feels like one that could be a conversation between others who are still on if they're interested. Take that Perfect. after we promote folks to panelists if they want Perfect. to be promoted. Um, so thank you both so much. That was excellent. I especially like the point about parachuting into a place. And I think that that's a lesson that translates for all of us, no matter what field we're in. You know, I have always done a lot of work with volunteers within organizations or within communities, and they also need to not parachute in. They need to land and say, what is it that you need? Um, and, and, and that, you know, harkens back to a message we had from a speaker a couple weeks ago who said, you know, Hampshire alums need to know when to bite their tongues, <laughs> when yeah. to stop and listen. And I think it's sort of a, you know, it's a, it's a really important lesson for all of us to internalize and take and no matter what we're doing. Um, thanks everyone for taking so much time out of your day to join us and to learn with us. And if you are not a member of the Hampshire community, this is when we say goodbye and we cut the recording. And thanks so much. Um, if you are a member of the Hampshire community and you'd like to stay on, just hang on for a moment and magic of uh, Zoom television here, you will become visible to our speakers and to each other. So just be patient. And thanks so much to the two of you.